You know, a lot of people don't realize that if we are to climb out of whatever it is we're in, as far as this economy is concerned, there's going to be small business that does it because they're the ones who create most of the jobs out there. National Federation of Independent Businesses has been uh, a conduit for uh, a conduit for that for small businesses for a long time. Amanda Austin uh, is with that organization. Amanda, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Glad to have you along. Yeah, thanks for having me today. So how much... Would Obamacare, do you think, if if we continue down this road, and I know that the House has voted for the repeal, we don't know why, where, where that's going as far as the Senate is concerned. we got some ideas uh, that it may not go too far. But people talk about Obamacare is going to save money. How do you see this as, as an advocate for small business out there? Well, I think it's all, all it's going to do is cost small business money. I mean, we're looking at 10 years of implementation on this enormous new law, We're looking at trillions of dollars in new taxes. We're looking at mandates on individuals, mandates on small employers, and we're looking at a new regulatory structure that could definitely cripple um, any amount of economic growth that we have today. So I think it's a significant uh, burden, frankly, on everyone and specifically on the small business community at this point. But we hear from the Obama administration this is actually going to save money. How do they arrive at those figures? Look, Phil, I think those are funny numbers. Um, I mean, we all know that... It's fuzzy math. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fuzzy math, <laughs> and we all know that, that, that this bill is, is, is basically increasing taxes on, on you know, the working class to the tune of about $600 billion to offset this bill. And they're just, it's fuzzy math at the end of the day, and, and, and I, frankly, I think any economist would go to bat to say that this is going to be a cost or long term. Yeah, I saw an article yesterday where there were like 200 economists, including several uh, who had been uh, heads of the uh, OMB and the CBO and some of these other government agencies out there that score these things, who say that Obamacare is going to be a disaster to the private sector and the private uh, businesses out there, despite what we're hearing from this administration and the Democrats. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a perfect point to bring up. You know, to have those, that type of clout on a letter like that, um, I think, really tells a lot about, about the fuzzy math that CBO did to arrive at these so-called savings. And, and I think the longer we continue with this law on the books, the more and more we're going to see it costing, you know, the federal government as well as the state budgets. And you and I know, I mean, that's where it hurts the hardest. But there's no doubt, though, that, there, that um, people are, or some people are struggling to pay for health insurance. I, I've often said that I believe part of the problem is that we've disconnected the consumer from the product. I mean, we, we've now come to expect businesses and many small businesses, too, to pay for this or at least to subsidize this, subsidize this. So we've essentially removed the consumer, which is us as employees, from the product, which is the health insurance. we got to find a way to reconnect that, and, and we got to find a way to lower the cost. In your estimation and with your organization, with the NFIB, what are some of the, uh, the ideas that you guys have for lowering health care costs without doing the Obamacare route? Yeah, I mean, I think really at the end of the day, what this what this bill did is increase access, and what it didn't do is decrease cost. And so I think when you're looking at, at what NFIB's priorities are, we're looking at decreasing cost. Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, when you ask the average person what they want, they want their cost to go down. Um, so this bill does the opposite. I think what, what we can look to is exactly what you said, putting the consumer back in the driver's seat and not putting them in the back seat with the, with the government in the front seat driving the car and telling, what, telling them what they should and should not have. So, you know, I think it starts really with, with choice, frankly, and letting the consumer choose what they think is necessary to include in their benefit package when they go to the doctor, not what the government thinks is important. I think it starts with things like medical liability, you know, getting the courts in check. Um, I think it starts with letting people purchase across state lines. You know, this is a highly regulatory industry, that, which we know increases costs on the consumer. We need to open up those barriers and let consumers do what they know how to do best, which is shop. Why, why is it, though, that we can't, Amanda, why can't we have a situation where, say, say my employer, which is going to subsidize, I don't, I don't even know how much they, of it they pay, I know how much I pay, but let's say they're going to say we're going to give you a certain amount for a voucher for your health insurance, and you can go in there at, at, you know, at open enrollment or whatever, you can go in there, and we're going to have like five, six, maybe 15 or 20 insurance companies to choose from. You said you know before, people have different needs. They, they fill out a questionnaire. It pops up, well, this, this company can do this for this price. And then we can start shopping around individually inside of the, the corporate or the business model 
and finding insurance that is specifically for us with different insurance companies within the same company that we're working for, does that sound like something that might work? I think this is going to be a key legislative priority for the NFIB, and you've totally hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think what business owners need to do, what they know, know to do best, which is run their business and create jobs. What they don't want to do is spend half their day in the business of, of offering health insurance you know, I think what what is the doable is basically to give a defined contribution or, as you say, a voucher, an, an amount of money that that employee can take and choose to buy whatever he or she wants that best fits their needs, not the employer's needs. Um, so I really think that does sort of put, you know, the, the consumer, the individual, the employee, the self-employed person, whoever you are, in the driver's seat. And it's simple and it's doable and it's a simple change to the tax code that can be done in a heartbeat. But we've got like 27 states now that have filed suit to stop Obamacare and their primary argument is this. Their primary argument is you cannot require an individual to buy health insurance. Why is it you think that I don't, as far as I know, not one of these states is arguing that the government doesn't have a right to force businesses to provide insurance. I mean, that to me seems like an easier case to win for one, because how in the world can the government come down and tell a business that they have to provide you with a certain service? It just seems to me absolutely ridiculous. If they're going to, if they're going to require them to provide you with insurance, then what's to stop the government from saying that they got to require you with food and shelter and a, a car and a house, you know, anything, anything else that they say that they have to provide you with? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the overall question is where does it stop? And, and I think that's where the states are. And as you know, there's continuing to be states that are, that are added to that lawsuit that can only increase the visibility of that. And frankly, you know, encroaching on the constitutional rights. And, and I think that, you know, the lawsuit will continue on. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna fight till the day is long on employer mandates and such and how we firmly believe that they're job killers at the end of the day. And I don't see that going away, Phil. Uh, that's going to be a constant battle in the federal government. Frankly, it's going to be a constant battle at the state level. Um, you know, but I think for now we've got a strong case on the books on the individual mandate, and I think it's going to go to the Supreme Court. Have you guys filed any friend of, uh, of the court uh, with, with any of these lawsuits? Are you involved in any of these? Yes, we are the key plaintiff. Uh, so we are, we are. We were in from day one, and we will be there till the end. Okay, and, but you're arguing about the individual mandate to buy insurance, but you're not arguing about the the businesses having to buy it, or am I wrong about that? No, we are fighting that. Uh, we're fighting it on all fronts. I mean, w- what now with the court case is it's standing right now is that it's it's a violation of the constitutional rights based on the individual mandate. Mm-hmm. Um, it, what you know, obviously that doesn't have anything to do with the employer mandate. That's a legislative fight um, that we have here at the federal and state level. Um, you know, but you know that's an endless issue for us. Um, you know, they, they think somehow that this is a great idea that employers should be mandated to offer insurance. So I, I think that you can continue to see a battle since it was included in the law, and we're going to fight to get it taken out. Oh, yeah, because the uh, health insurance was provided as a, as a benefit, as an incentive to try to get uh, employees to come work for you instead of another company, and everybody started doing this. And then they start things like, well, a 401K, and then they do a 401K match, and then these things are going to be required by law uh, if, if, if we don't watch out because there's nothing to say that it can't be. Right. You know, just you know, members of Congress should remember you know, how business works. It's, just, it's compensation at the end of the day, and, and business owners should be allowed to do what they need to do to attract qualified employees. That's it. Right. The government does not need to get between the employer and the employee relationship. That's right. Exactly. Absolutely. Well, look, if people want to know more about the NFIB, uh, is it NFIB.org? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, no, it's NFIB.com. Dot com. And, okay. uh, I would encourage people to go to the website and learn more about these issues and many of the other issues that small business owners are fighting each day. Excellent. Amanda Austin, NFIB, the National Federation for Independent Business. I got that right, did I not? You got that right. All right, all right. All right Amanda. Keep, uh, keep uh, slugging away. Uh, if we can say that in this politically uh, uh, <laughs> correct atmosphere now, uh, just keep hammering away, I guess. That won't hurt anybody. And we appreciate, yeah, appreciate your information. Let's keep it soft these days, but thanks for having us on today. I appreciate it. Okay, thanks, Amanda.